please be seated. God in, encourages us to come. He encourages us to pray and to unite our hearts and our minds to that end. So let's, let's do so. Father, we come into your presence this morning. Uh, we gather as a congregation to come into your presence and to seek your face uh, that uh, we, we want to acknowledge you as our rock and our refuge, our strength, our fortress, our hope, our deliverer. We want to acknowledge you as the great I am, the one who possesses living waters, who is the bread of life, Jehovah Jireh, the great provider, not only for material things, but for our souls. And we, as we come into your presence today, Lord, through prayer, and as we gather to worship, we pray that our hearts would be still, that we would be reminded that you're God, that you have everything taken care of that we will ever need or ever want. And we, um, we thank you that you have revealed yourself in, to us in the person of Jesus Christ and through the power of your word. Uh, we thank you that your word is perfect, and we thank you that it reveals the person of Jesus Christ to us. And we come this morning, Lord, uh, as divine partakers. Uh, we've been given everything for life and godliness, and we thank you for that. And all we have to do, Lord, is unpack the package that you've given to us. Uh, you've given us the Holy Spirit. You've given us Christ. Uh, you've given us everything that you could ever give us. And we pray that uh, we would come to that realization. Uh, thank you that we can't work for our salvation. And thank you that we don't have to work for our salvation. And thank you that you're not a God of legalism. You're a God of grace and mercy and truth. And... We thank you that you've brought us into this grace and mercy and truth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give us the grace to understand the freedom that we have in Christ, uh, that that would lead to great joy and great strength and a great renewal of hope. Uh, Lord, we, uh, you know that uh, we need our hearts renewed with hope. And we know that Christ is our hope. So we, um, we pray that we're reminded to look at him and to find our hope renewed as we do that. Father, thank you for the, uh, the song this morning. Uh, this is amazing grace. And um, marvel at that. Uh, and it's our desire that we would magnify you this morning. Um, even if our, we struggle with a song, you know the conditions of our hearts. Uh, and we want to magnify uh, the Lord in this place and in our hearts this morning. Also, Father, too, I bless you for answered prayer to open up Matt's heart to the gospel. And right now, Lord, I pray that you would visit him and you would strengthen him and you would encourage him uh, with the scriptures that he heard growing up in church, uh, with uh, all the things that he knows about you. I, I pray that you would strengthen those things and that uh, thank you for meeting him where he's at and pray that you would stir his soul um, for a thirst for hunger and righteousness. I will just bless you so much for 
leading Matt in that decision. We also lift up his wife, Martha, that you might strengthen her in her inner person and uh, renew uh, her hope in God. Also, Father, too, uh, think of Harold this morning. Um, thank you so much for Harold, uh, for the blessings he's been to our church family. And uh, thank you that, uh, that you're everything uh, that he could ever need, want or hope or ask for. And so I pray that you would um, visit him with, uh, in, in the quietness of his heart, uh, that you would help him to deal with the, the pain and the <coughs> physical ailments that he has. Uh, we ask that your will would be done to that end and give the doctor's wisdom and understanding with his condition. Uh, also, Father, too, uh, I'm ever mindful of uh, Diana Wynn and uh, her situation with the cancer, uh, with her family. Um, pray that uh, she would sense your presence. I also lift up Sandy Sherman this morning. Uh, bring comfort to her heart and to her soul. Give her the desires of her uh, or her, her hope for her family. Also, Father, to um, think of Fred Legler and um, his, uh, his condition with, the, uh, with his legs. Uh, we pray that you would open Fred's heart as you have Matt's. Uh, Lord, as I said earlier, you know all of our hearts. You know the things that are on our hearts right now. You know the burdens, the cares, uh, the things that we need uh, to take out of the message this morning, uh, out of uh, this worship service uh, as we hear scripture and as we pray and as we share uh, our time together. And thank you that you will do that uh, for us. Thank you for, um, for that in advance. Uh, we offer up all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have our first uh, scripture reading this morning. So our first reading this morning is the first seven verses of the 34th Psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. This is the word of our Lord. This morning's second scripture reading, also from the Old Testament, from the book of Second Kings. We'll be reading verses 8 through 23 in the sixth chapter of 2 Kings. And if you're using the New Church Bible, that starts on page 339. Again, these 2 Kings chapter 6, starting with verse 8 through verse 23. Now the king of Aram was warring against Israel, and he counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Aramans are coming down there. The king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, will you tell me which one of us 
is for the king of Israel? One of his servants said, No, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that speak, that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots, chariots of fire all around Elijah. When they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. When they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, O oh Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? He answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Let bread, set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the marauding bands of Arameans did not come again into the land of Israel. May the Lord add his blessing. What a great passage of scripture. It's incredible, isn't it? Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, in my weakness, may you be made strong to your people this day. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So, several months ago, I was talking to another brother in Christ. And we were marveling at how people are oblivious to what is happening around them. Uh, we are just amazed at how ignorant people are to the political and cultural trends. And if you talk to many, and I think you know this, if you talk to many people, they're totally devoid of spiritual truth in what is happening. Right? It's amazing. We're just absolutely amazed at how many people are blinded to the spiritual world and the things of God. And we concluded the conversation by saying, as it was in the days of Noah. It's very, very true. This passage before us here is a classic in light of these truths. Devoid, blinded, ignorant, oblivious. Elisha the prophet here, and I kind of set the table, uh, Elisha the prophet has a new servant. If you go back to chapter 5, Gehazi was the servant. And Gehazi had sold out for silver and gold, and he became leprous. And he was, um, uh, so he went out from the presence of Elisha. So this is a, is a different servant. And perhaps he's young in the Lord, or... 
he lacks the experience of seeing God do miraculous things. In either case, uh, as the story goes, he needs his eyes opened to the spiritual realities despite the physical circumstances and conditions. Now, let me uh, quickly summarize the account that Dave just read because uh, kind of like rounded out just a little bit. But the, the king of Aram and the king of Israel are at war. And the way you want to understand this is the kingdom of Israel has now been divided. This is post-Solomon. You have ten northern tribes, you have two southern tribes. We're dealing with the ten northern tribes of Israel. And, and so that's what this account has to do with. And so Elisha, the seer here, is now enabled to divinely know what takes place literally in the king's bedroom when they devise the military strategy and the plan to attack. God sees it all, and he communicates that to Elisha, and Elisha tells the king of Israel. Uh, what is spoken in the king's bedroom is because of the Spirit of God. God knows it all. And, and, and so, the way you want to understand this war is the king of Israel is probing. He's trying to find weaknesses in the defense and send marauding bands in and, and conduct raids. And repeatedly, the king of Aram is frustrated. I mean, he even calls his people together and he says, who's the traitor among us here? And once he's convinced that there's no traitor, he sets out an army, he sends out an army to capture one man. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us how many troops were sent out, but they were sent out to encircle a whole, a whole hill, a whole, a whole town. This is a lot of troops, folks. Now, this is how you actually kind of want to understand the plot, because the, the plot is actually seen as a comedy, right? Uh, that's a, a comedy narrative. And it's, and it's often um, kind of paralleled with 2 Kings chapter 1. Uh, Elijah, Elisha's predecessor, had, 50, had three groups of 50 sent to capture him. And the first two groups of 50, he calls fire down from heaven. And then finally, the third captain comes begging and pleading and asking for God's mercy and grace and says, you know, uh, you can do anything you want, but would you please come? And he had the right approach. The other guys were going to strong arm Elijah. Didn't work. And so the third guy, Elijah goes with them. So it, it's kind of, it, it's seen as a comedy. Uh, you send all these people to get one guy. Uh, I don't know what the, ra the ratio in 2 Kings 1 was 50 to 1, three times. Uh, and I'm not sure what the ratio is here, 500 to 1. So uh, that's how you want to look at this. Now, it's comical to actually think that someone can capture a prophet of God when God hems that prophet in. Amen? That's the comedy here. How can you go after this guy when God protects him? And it's no different in our day. It's actually comical to think that people can outthink God, outsmart him, outwit him, or outmaneuver him. And yet, people do it all day long. They think he never sees. They think that he, they never, he never knows. And, and yet, what does the scripture say? He searches the heart. He knows the motives, the intent of all of the hearts in one nanosecond. And that's power, folks. That's knowledge and that's power. He knows and sees it all before the plans are made. Knows all about tomorrow. Uh, David says in Psalm 139, verse 4, Even before there is a word on my tongue, Behold, O Lord, you know it all. That's true with the saint. That's true with the wicked person. Nothing, I love this, I heard, I said this before, nothing has occurred to him. He knows all about your tomorrows and knows what you need. Uh, Psalm 2, verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. 
the Lord scoffs at them, those who are his enemies, and are trying to outmaneuver and outthink him at every turn. It's comical. That's why this is seen as a comedy narrative. Now, I want you to think about it, but we have politicians and world leaders who think that they know better than God. Just look around us. It's insane. People in academia who think that they know better than God. And I want you to, as I was typing this, I was thinking, I want you folks to let that ruminate for a second. Kind of digest it. Think on it. World leaders and politicians and people in academia in these think tank institutions that think that they know better than God. The God who's created everything. The God who upholds all things by the power of his word. Who has set eternal principles in place. And structure. Where if you follow them, you're blessed. And if you don't, the whole house comes down. And, 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 and so let that ruminate for, for a minute. The arrogance and the hubris, the pride. It's amazing. In their wisdom, they became fools. They reduce the God of heaven to an infinite idol in their mind of their own thinking and their own doing and their own choosing. 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2 tells us that we ought to pray for those in authority. And those in authority need a lot of our prayers. Scripture says, lift up holy hands. Pray that their eyes are opened. Because I'm not sure that they know who they're dealing with. Amen? A couple of other points that I want to make here. In the account... Elijah prays that the enemies of, of Israel, who are also the enemies of God, they're also Elisha's enemies. He prays that they are struck with blindness. Uh, the Hebrew word for blindness here, it's the inability to find one's way, like you kind of grope about. It's the inability to properly see. And it, and it can be used literally or figuratively, but it's almost as if I, uh, 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 Elisha prays that like an infusion of com, com, confusion is just like brought into the mix. So they, they set out on this mission and at the end at, they, they can't complete it because they're all clouded. It's a blindness. Uh, now, here's the other thing that you should know. Elisha, actually, it's not a physical blindness, it's figurative. Because Elisha actually leads them 12 miles from Dotham to Samaria. It's a 12-mile journey. They don't recognize him much in the same way. You remember the disciples on the Emmaus Road didn't recognize Jesus? And so they're divinely blinded here. And they were confused to the point where their, their judgment's clouded. Mentally and spiritually, they didn't know what they were doing. And... That's actually a picture, if you will, of what we've got today in our world. People are totally blinded. And the way you want to understand this metaphor here, it, it's, it's a metaphor of the judgment of God. When, when, when you have blinders on, and when, when it's important for you to see, or me to see, and we have blinders on, that can be problematic. Uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 speaks to this principle. Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes. In other words, to, uh, to not see is to have blinders on. And it's a form of ignorance and judgment. Have you ever taken a horse-drawn carriage ride in the city? Maybe even in the country. If you go down to Pennsylvania Dutch, you see the, you know, the, uh, the Amish buggies. The horses always have what? Like they have these blinders, these side blinders. And what is the purpose of that? So they don't get spooked or distracted. It, the idea is to give them tunnel vision so they just see one thing. 
Now, if you're taking a carriage buggy ride in the city, that's a good thing because you're probably safer when the horse has the blinders on. But if we're talking about this spiritually, this is a very, very bad thing. Blinders are not good. The, the antithesis of blindness here is open, open my eyes that I might see. And that's a form of blessing. And, and so when uh, uh, Elisha prays this prayer, it's that the distractions of the physical army would be removed. That his ignorance to what is happening in the spiritual realm would be eliminated. It's to bring clarity and to bring proper vision to bear. It's spiritual discernment. Do you ever go into a situation and you try to spiritually discern that situation? That's what it is. And, and so the sense here is to, be, is to be blessed when we truly see what's taking place. In the physical realm, you want to actually be able to see everything, especially in the spiritual realm. And this is, this is a great prayer. Open, open my eyes that I might see. So what, what, is, what is the spiritual takeaway here? As I looked at this, uh, I pray that our eyes might be, might, might, might be opened and see what's happening around us. In the spiritual realm, what is God doing? In the political realm, what's the hidden agenda? Because there's always an agenda. In the social realm, what's the next manipulative move by the ruling class in this country? In the cultural realm, what else are they going to roll out that's anti-God? In the economic realm, in other words, open my eyes to see the wickedness being devised so that I'm in the know. I want to know. I want to see it coming. And that's my prayer here. Open my eyes that I might see. That I might see the political lies so I can talk about that from the pulpit. That I might be able to see the social agenda that's destructive to our society because it will affect you, your children, and your grandchildren. That's why I preach it. Not just to get you guys political. I pray that I might see the cultural revolution to understand what's of God and what's not. And I pray that the eyes of everyone's open to see that you can actually see what they're doing to control you and me and everyone else economically. The shame culture. I'm telling you, it's going to get to the point where they're going to say, you have to get the injection. I had somebody say to me the other day, well, what about the HIPAA laws? You know, it's my body, it's my privacy. If somebody says to you, hey, did you get the injection? Here's a great line, none of your business. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, a, you know, it's on a need to know basis? No, it's not. You don't need to know. None of your business. By the way, my business, I'm not getting it. Never put that stuff in my body. I've said this before, I say it again. Per perceive, listen to what they say, but watch what they do. It's important. So you'll be prepared. It will serve you well, and it will serve others well, because you can also pass that information along. So I, I ask God to open your eyes to all these things, to discern, to know, to recognize, to realize. Because you know what I see? And this, God being my witness, this is what I see. I believe a lot of people don't want to see. Like the ostrich, they just want to bury their head. They think it's all going to go away. They don't care to see. Just want it to go all away. Wake up someday like a fairyland. It's all gone away. I read a book a number of years ago. It was uh, by a former CIA agent. He spent like 25 years in the Middle East. It was called, Hear No Evil, See No Evil. And he said, that's the culture 
at the top of the CIA. They don't want to deal, they don't want to deal with, with anything that's evil. They just want to collect information. They don't want to say it. I, I think that that typifies our culture. People don't want to see the evil. In fact, they're calling the evil good, right? That's what they do. That's, that's the mantra. You, have, you, have you come across people that don't want to get involved? They don't want to care for their neighbor. They don't want to do the right thing. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to speak out. They don't want to stand up. If you stand up, you stand out. That's why they don't want to stand up. Because if you start to see what's actually going on, now you have knowledge. And with knowledge comes responsibility. And with responsibility comes commitment. And with commitment comes personal cost. And people don't want to pay the price. They don't want to speak out. They don't want to be censored. They don't want to be shamed. So they, they just sit down. They don't do anything. You know, it, it's the old adage, ignorance is bliss. You know, I look at this passage and I say, I don't know about you, but I want to, I want to be informed. I want to know what's going on in my world. I don't want to be blinded or ignorant or blindsided. I want to see it coming. I want to know what may potentially affect my kids, my church family, my own family, possibly grandchildren, my neighbor. I want to know it. I want to see it. Here you go. I want an Elisha in my ranks. I want the servant of Elisha to see as well. That's what I want. I want those kinds of people around me. And I always say, praise God if you're given the ability to see it. Because you're going to be, you're going to be way far ahead of 95%, 98% of all the other people. Remember, eight people entered the ark, right? Eight people. You know, as I look at this text here, Elisha's servant, I believe, ultimately understood the power of God, the spiritual realities. Uh, there are more of us than there are more of them. Did you ever stop and think about how God has, in, has hemmed you in at, on every side? You know, David says that in Psalm 1, how, how God protects you. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Whole army, whole spiritual army around each and every one of us. That's how I see it. You know, uh, the kings of the earth have their armies, but they're nothing in his sight. They're but dust. The legions of hell and Satan are nothing in his sight. They are but dust, and they all are coming to nothing. This is a picture of your spiritual protection in Christ. Nothing can touch you unless God allows it. So I also look at this passage and I say, open my eyes, Lord, uh, to see how to diffuse situations of conflict. That's a, that's a huge, huge thing. I want you, I want you to notice, so this is a, there's a conflict brewing here. Isn't it an interesting that Elisha doesn't pull a Jonah. You know what Jonah did, right? He ran. Elisha prays. He doesn't run. Cool, calm, collected. Totally in tune with God. By the way, um, speaking of Jonah, did anybody read about the Massachusetts lobster <laughs> diver who got sucked up by the humpback whale? And he wasn't spit out like three days later or three minutes. I think it was like the article said like 30 or 40 seconds. Jerry sent it to me. And, it, and, and she put Jonah 2.0. <laughs> Jonah 2.0. You know, I was, I, I was thinking about this. Is, is this not God's way of trying to get people to plug in? You know, everybody says about the story of Jonah, ah, not possible, impossible, never happened. This is like the second or third time in my lifetime that I've heard stories like this. This is, this is crazy. Jonah 2.0. By, by the way, uh, Jonah's conflict with God 
uh, was resolved. As they say, it was eventually resoluted. <laughs> God solved that conflict real quick, didn't he? How do you, how do you resolve conflict? <laughs> Back to Elisha here. Um, if you take a look at the account, um, and this might kind of seem like it doesn't fit, but the man of God is charged with using deception. Oh, I love this story. Deception. As if it's sinful, right? The way you want to understand this here is that deception is a strategy and a tool in war. And, I, and so as I look at this, I say, and we were talking about this back in Bible school, or Bible school, uh, Bible study um, last month, several weeks back. I'll lie all day long to save your life. I will lie all day long to save my life. I will use any form of deception or tool to blind the eyes of the enemy, just so we can get out of dodge. That's how you, have, how you, how you want to see it, right? Uh, did, you follow, um, did you follow the Israeli-Hamas conflict the last couple months? Deception was used by Israel against Hamas. The government, I don't know if you read this, the government let the word out that the ground invasion into Gaza Strip had begun by the Israelis. It didn't begin. But all the Hamas soldiers go running into the tunnels and Israel bombed the tunnels. All was fair in love and war, amen? That's what they say. Deception was used. Uh, we just celebrated D-Day, right? If you know a little bit of history, leading up to the D-Day invasion, what did the Allied powers do? They got these big air mattress type blow-ups, they made them look like tanks and planes, and they staged them in southern England, uh, right across from the shortest point into France, leading the Germans to believe that the attack was going to go there, when all along it was going to be at Normandy. Deception. They are German airplanes fly over, oh, this is where they're going to attack. And, and so they were totally caught off guard. You can call it deception. You can also call it spiritual blindness. And, and, and yet the, the reality is, is this. It only works if God gives you favor and God allows the enemy to take the bait. It was true for D-Day. It was true for Israel and Hamas a couple months back. It was true for Elijah. Now, uh, Deception was used by Elijah, but there's kind of like a little twist here to it, and I want to bring this out in the text, because Elijah actually speaks truth. Remember when Abraham, you know, said that about his wife, Sarah, oh, this is my sister, <laughs> and, but it was, it, was, it was truth, and yet was deception kind of mixed? That's what Elijah, I'm sorry, Elisha actually does here. He's temporarily staying in Dothan, but he didn't live in Dotham. He was from Samaria. And so he leads them to the area where he was originally from. And he never says, hey, I'm Malaysia. That would be stupid, right? That would be his life. But he, he kind of mixes a little bit. Oh, I'll, I'll show you where he lives. <laughs> That's what he basically did. Little bit of truth, little bit of deception. And so I, I look at this passage and I say, uh, Lord, open, open our eyes that we might see how, how are we to deal with conflict resolution? Uh, clearly, Jonah didn't work. So what are we to say? What are we to do? Do we speak truth and yet withhold it? I mean, even Jesus said, don't cast pearl before swine, right? You don't tell them everything. And, and so I want you to notice here that Elisha, being in tune with God, has the right mix and the right application and the right strategy. So he takes them on a 12-mile hike right into the heartland, the wheelhouse of the king of Israel. And, and who, who would see this coming? 
Uh, the, the king of Israel, it's like, he, he didn't see that coming. And it's like, what am I supposed to do? Kill him? Twice he had. Should I kill him? And look at, look at what Elisha does. This is incredible. Set bread and water before them. In other words, <laughs> feed them and throw them a feast. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of antithetical to what I would do to my enemy, right? And yet, it worked. Open my eyes, Lord, that I might see how to deal with my enemies. How do I, how do I resolve conflict? How do I deal with the enemy? And, and, and so what seems intuitive here is actually counterintuitive. You don't want to kill them, prolongs the war, and yet sometimes God says, kill them all. And yet what is seemingly counterintuitive is actually intuitive. So sometimes we think that we have the right approach, and we never consult God, and it's, it's a disaster. And other times we have God's consultation is like, well, okay, and it works. And so... And so when you look at this account here, the out-of-the-box thinking is actually the right approach. You know, um, I read an article years ago. You have traditional thinkers. They think within the circle or within the box. Then you have thinking outside the box. That's what we have tried to do as a church leadership team. Try to think outside the box, you know, and, and defer to God. Get the right approach. And, and this is the principle that comes out of here. God knows every situation through and through, and he knows the proper approach. And, and so Elisha's spot on to this. And the feeding of Israel's enemies here are actually what seems to bring peace, at least for a time. Now, I would, I would not argue that this is the norm uh, and recipe for dealing with national enemies. Uh, it, it, it kills me to see how our leadership wants to deal with the enemies of the United States, like give them everything. Um, I wouldn't argue that this is the right approach. God knows every situation. God knows the right approach. You always defer to him, and he'll give you the right recipe and the right approach. And that's the principle. Because the application may always differ. Uh, some things that are said may be right, and some things that are said may just stoke the flame. You don't know, but God knows. These are also enemies of Elisha. They're enemies of Israel. They're enemies of God. They're enemies of Elisha. They were out to kidnap him. So this is a personal thing, too. And... Uh, and, and so he has personal skin in the game. Uh, and, and the approach is unorthodox, but it works. And so this is the takeaway that, that I see with this. How do I deal with my enemies? How do I deal with conflict resolution? Feed them. Give them water. Give them the things of God. Love them. That's what Jesus said, right? Love your enemy. Maybe they come to their senses. Perhaps they make peace and go home. But in this particular account, the army understood that it was a mission in futility. They're not going to capture Elisha. They're not going to outsmart God. And so they eat, they drink, they're merry, and they go home. And, you know, I, I, I was looking at this. You know, when you're dealing with unsaved people, they're lost to their own ways and devices, are they not? They're in bondage. They're in captive to their sin and their doings. of a darkened mindset. Perhaps God uses the hunger and thirst motif to get to their hearts. You know, I typically in the flesh, you know how I want to deal with the enemies? <laughs> like the king of Israel. Kill them. Get rid of them. And that's not the proper approach, is it? It never works never ever works. You know, you get rid of, you chop off one head, another head comes up. <laughs> That's the problem. 
So I, I look at this and I, I, th I think our response is to feed them. Feed them the good things of God. Uh, perhaps they taste and see that the Lord is good. So in closing this morning, um, this is what God has laid on my heart uh, to tell you folks. It's a great, great prayer. Uh, open my eyes that I might see. Uh, that I might see the things uh, the way the Lord sees them. When, 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 when we see that, we're good to go. We're in a good place. When we don't see that, we're not in a good place. So the, que the question is whether we want to be an Elisha or his servant. You know, do we, do we want to see the things of God and what God is doing, or do we want to be like the ostrich, you know, just disconnect, displug, not care, and not be informed? Uh, I, I know what, where I want to be. Anyway, that's what God has laid upon my heart this morning. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this passage of Scripture. And may we have Elisha in our ranks. And may we have uh, the servant of Elisha in our ranks. People that understand what you're doing. People that understand your power, your goodness, your mercy, your grace. Uh, people that understand that there are more of us uh, that surround us and that there are more of them. Uh, we, we bless you and thank you that you hold all things in the power of your hand. We thank you that you know uh, the wickedness that's being devised and you always have a plan and an answer um, to address that. Uh, we bless you for that. Uh, may we never get to the place, Lord, where we're like the politicians and the leaders, um, people in academia, that um, where we think that we can outsmart you, outwit you, outthink you, or outmaneuver you. Uh, may it never, ever, ever be. Uh, we thank you for this time today. Uh, open our eyes that we might see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing song this morning, uh, most appropriately, number 633, Open Our Eyes, Lord.